Oh, hi, I'm Christina Buffo, and I'm honored today to be introducing Professor Dick French. Professor French earned his BA, MS, and PhD in astrophysics from Cornell University, and he's currently the Louise Sherwood McDowell and Sarah Francis Whiting Professor of Astrophysics here at Wellesley College. In addition to his numerous teaching accomplishments, including the Piansky Prize in 2004, he was a principal investigator of the radio science subsystem of the Cassini mission, which he'll talk about more today. His involvement with this mission stretched from its early pre-launch days in 1990 until its end in late 2017. This mission explored Saturn and its moons, including Titan, which is his favorite. Since he asked me to keep this introduction brief, I'll limit it to one more detail. One of the most emotional parts of this Cassini mission led to his picture being printed on the front page of the LA Times. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Dick French. Thanks very much, Christina. It's really uh, an honor to be here as part of the Albright Institute. I, I wish that I could go back in time and change a few other aspects of my life to be able to join you uh, in a moment like this. Uh, but it's really a thrill to be able to welcome so many astrophysics majors to uh, this opportunity. Any astrophysics majors here? Maybe by the end of today's lecture, you'll, you'll all. This is not really a sales pitch. Actually, the biggest challenge for me, I'm so delighted to be here early because I looked at the list of speakers and visitors that you have, and it's, uh, even for a geriatric like me who's been around here a long time, it's really daunting to see all of the big names that you've got. So uh, you have really a treat in store for you ahead. My goal for today is to do two things. I want to uh, share my love of the universe with you. That's the easy part. The more challenging part is to connect that to uh, why you're here today, which is to be thinking about uh, technology in the future, uh, international technology, and some of the global challenges. So what I uh, would like to do is to use the Cassini mission and my experience with it as an object lesson in what it was like to be a scientist and not a politician or a social scientist or somebody who was used to thinking about global issues and how gradually over the course of participating in this international mission I and others learned the kind of group work that we needed to do in order to be effective. And then at the end I'm going to take a little moment to uh, take you into some French science fiction from the 19th century um, by Camille Flammarion and then move on to some challenging thought questions that I think maybe we can talk about during a discussion session. So that's, that's the plan and um, to save you from carpal tunnel, um, you, this can be a note-free zone. I don't think there are going to be points where it's probably going to be useful for you to take notes, but I, uh, I hope that you can just uh, enjoy the slideshow and uh, remember the key points. Then at the end, I'll have a few bullet points that are kind of the lessons that you really need to learn for the talk. But uh, for most of what I'd like to do is to, is to turn the lights down and to move away from the arena of the political uh, discussions that we're having every morning in the New York Times and take us to outer space. So let's get started on a tour of outer space. So at this point I think it would be great to turn the lights down. So I'm always, it's always risky to ask this, how many of you were alive in 1997? <sighs> I still feel young. In my introductory astronomy class this semester I said, how many of you were alive in 1994? Okay, just a few, a few oldsters in the room, yeah. I, so, so take yourself back to 1997. You probably remember this moment. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and liftoff of the Cassini spacecraft on a billion mile trek to Saturn. Pitch program is in, roll program is in. We have cleared the tower, and the Cassini spacecraft is on its way to Saturn. Now, I'd love to be able to say, I'd love to be able to say that I was there watching that launch, but I was there two days earlier, and just five minutes before they were going to push the button, the announcer said, we have to scrub the launch because the winds are too high in the stratosphere, but come back in 48 hours and we'll have the launch then. I said, 
I can't come back in 48 hours. I have to teach Astronomy 101 at Wellesley. <laughs> so I came back and taught Astronomy 101 at 8.30 in the morning to a bunch of sleepy students who didn't seem to appreciate the sacrifice that I'd made <laughs> by, missing, by missing the launch too, but I just, um, I really didn't feel that I could be away. So I watched it on NASA TV on a little one inch screen on my computer and instead of this roar of the engines that my teammates reported as a religious experience, I heard a tiny little hiss of, <laughs> of this engine. And, but really, when you think about it, heading a billion miles away, and it was 1997, but as Christina mentioned, I started on this in 1989, so what was I doing during all of those eight years? So part of what I want to be telling you today is the excitement of what we learned when we got to Saturn but also to remind you that it took me 14 years from starting on the project to taking the first pictures. So think of a project that you've worked on in your lifetime or going to work on in your lifetime where you're not even gonna know whether it works for 14 years. And that's what this experience has been like for me. Well, going to Saturn is really an amazing world because uh, it has rings, it has a, a panoply of moons, it will take you through the entire Greek mythology to pronounce the names of all of these moons. Each of them is their own uh, neat world, including Titanic Titan, which I'll be describing later. It was really tough for me to come up with a favorite moon, but I'll show you later why Titan qualifies as really an amazing moon. And then there's the little ravioli moon pan in the upper right corner that I wanted to show you as well. Well, Saturn is really a giant planet. We call it a giant planet for a good reason, because in this rare alignment between the Earth and the Moon, which you can see on the left and right hand side, Saturn stretches all the way from the Earth to the Moon, were it in the inner solar system. It's truly an enormous planet. In fact, it's so big, I sometimes call it the little star that couldn't. Because if, <laughs> if Saturn were a little bit bigger, it would have enough pressure and heat in the center to burn hydrogen to helium, to go nuke, and to be able to burn just like a small sun. But it isn't quite massive enough to do that, uh, so we live in a solar system with just a single star. And the spacecraft craft that we have, the Cassini spacecraft, everybody talks about space age technology. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But you have to remember that this spacecraft was designed in 1989, so think of the technology that your great-great-grandparents had, and that's a little bit closer to what we were working with when we were trying to design and build a spacecraft. So usually when scientists give talks about uh, the Cassini mission, they don't tell you how they actually got involved in the project, and I thought it would be worth telling you an object lesson in how you actually get to be a team member of a mission like this. And so it starts with something called an announcement of opportunity. So uh, they sent it out in the mail in 1989 to a lot of scientists, and they said, would you like to apply for being part of this international mission? And I spent some time putting a proposal together. Here's the proposal that I put together in 1990. It was one of two proposals that I put into the Cassini mission. One was to be a co-investigator on an ultraviolet instrument and when I was at Cornell working with a colleague on the final stages of this proposal, one of my thesis committee members said, too bad about that proposal of yours, Dick. I said, what are you talking about? They said, well, that ultraviolet photometer, they'll never approve it. I said, well, why didn't you tell me that before? I spent a year working on it. He said, you wouldn't have believed me. I said, well, maybe I would have believed you. <laughs> so I was downcast and he said, well, you can still be on the Cassini mission if you apply to be a member of an instrument team where the instrument's already built. I said, but Joe, the proposals are due in a week. And he said, stop complaining, start writing. <laughs> so, so I never tell this to students who are in classes that I'm actually teaching because, but this is the term paper I wrote the night before that got the A. None of you have had that experience, I'm sure.